Now this guy, I've got an introduction and I will read part of it, but uh, this is a Cochranton graduate. Um, he's also a mayor, so a mayor to mayor here. He's the mayor of Tanawa, New York. And uh, his presentation is, be is called Caught Between Two Worlds, Captive and Natives on the um, Colonial Frontier. William Snyder is currently a seventh and eighth grade uh, science teacher in Panama, New York. Besides teaching, Bill enjoys his role as a living historian, bringing to life colonial skills and his ancestral Shawnee culture. As part of his historical role, Bill has been worked with many historic sites and has helped with them design and implement, implementation of a lot of programming. He also works with the Boy Scouts as a merit badge instructor, teaching various skills, including outdoor topics and wilderness survival. He has done presentations and consulted with Forts Ticonderoga, Pitt, Niagara, and LaBeouf, and as well as Pickett's, Pickett's Fort, Fortness, Louisville, and Bushy Run Historic Site. He's a member of the Harmony Historical Society, a past president, but also the Fort LaBeouf Historical Society, French Creek Living History. Is there any time you don't do anything? Uh, Ohio Valley Alliance and the Contemporary Long Rifle Associates and Prickett's Fort Foundation. He's also a member and helped us with the organization of this event. So we've been very pleased to have him and uh, we hope that he finds three or four more things because we like busy people, they get things done. Please welcome Bill Schneider. Thank you. Um, hopefully, what we're going to do today, I'll give you kind of a uh, rehash a little bit. We're going to whet your appetite, so to speak, into this topic that Beth was originally going to uh, present to you. Uh, my presentation is kind of an overview of this uh, phenomena with Native Americans and how they dealt with um, certain aspects of their life and what Beth's presentation is going to do, and hopefully we're going to get her back here next year to actually give it, is she's going to give the more in-depth flavor of her family connection with this phenomena of captives and native adoption and give you more of a personal insight. When you start to talk about uh, natives and this concept of taking captives and what they did with the captives can become very in-depth and when you start to look at it you start to it's like uncovering layers and layers and layers and you start finding all these personal stories and <clears throat> for some of you that were here yesterday uh, especially for the round table a couple themes came up with about Excuse me. Thinking about the perspective of where the information that we utilize today in our research, where does it come from? And how reliable it is. The question came up yesterday about, you know, we have three conflicting stories of the same event, but each one comes from a different side or a different perspective. And so I think you have to take that into consideration, but you also have to take into consideration that many of the documents, Matt Wolf hit on this yesterday, many of the documents that we are using are archived military records. So if you think about this and think about the purpose of the documentation, the purpose of the documentation in the 18th century was to send back an extremely detailed account so that the powers to be could best come up with a plan to deal with whatever forces they were going to encounter. So the best thing they found out is we need to do detailed research about our enemy to find out what we need to expect so we can prepare our troops, so we can you know, do the best that we can. It's nothing different than we do that we do today's world. It's all in military intelligence. So all these journals and accounts are coming with extreme amounts of fine detail, and I find it hard as a historian to doubt that that's what what happened, what they saw, because they were liable for sending the correct information. 
you're not going to want to send incorrect information back to the higher ups and then have a catastrophic event happen when the troops hit the shore. So uh, it, just a different perspective. And I didn't. I was thinking about that on the drive home last night. I'm like, I don't know if people realize how these pieces of information came about. Um, I will mention in passing, if you, if you have not had a chance to see the Jesuit relations, uh, and you can, with the internet today, there's lots of stuff that's accessible online. Uh, the Jesuit relations, that was another thing. You know, the French uh, Jesuits were embedded in the different native cultures, and they were sending back detailed accounts so that the powers to be could come up with a good plan for trying to convert the natives to Christianity. Um, and they needed to understand their customs. They needed to understand where they were coming from. So all those bits and pieces of information, um, you know, were not made up. They were, they were being meticulously recorded and then sent um, back to Europe. When we talk about captives, many of the captives uh, who were released or traded back or repatriated, um, it's just like today's world. That has got to be the hot, if you think about it, in the 18th century, you just spent eight years of your life living as a Native American, what's the first thing everybody else in your European society wants to know? They want to know what happened to you, how did you survive, and what horrible things are these people like? And guess what? It's just like the National Enquirer. They have all the, the paparazzi and the reporters, and they were actually able to tell their story and in some cases, the story wasn't as bad as people wanted to, to believe. Um, so we're going to kind of give you a little bit of flavor, a little bit of look. I will tell you this, I'm, I am not an expert. I don't ever consider myself an expert in any of all the things that I do. I tell everybody I'm just a learner on the path, and I'm sharing with you what I have found. Um, any of this information you can look up on the internet. I'm going to show you a couple of really cool books, and most of them are still all available. And I'll show you the deal of the century later if you go to Fort Niagara. <clears throat> but uh, let's kind of delve into this. So, um, and I know hopefully you'll be able to see some of the images. I was up till 11 o'clock last night trying to tweak all the images. Keeping in mind, I don't have a big screen behind me, that you got two little TV screens. Uh, the picture on this, um, you, if you have any questions about the stuff at Fort Pitt, when um, Michael Burke is here, he was one of the key instruments in the design and the build of some of the couple of sets that you're going to see here. This was actually uh, a model that they did of a young boy that is, was taken captive and is being taken back to the village and they had a wonderful uh, display on this topic two years ago it was one of their rotational displays they had at Fort Pitt. Uh, taking of captives needs to be viewed as a part of culture for Eastern Woodland Indians. If you go back in world history itself, the idea of taking prisoners uh, in, in times of war is nothing new. But the Native Americans, it wasn't considered solely a prisoner of war when you took uh, a captive. It had a little bit different meaning in many cases. And I threw up on this slide to kind of explain to you how or why my idea of that captives is part of a culture is that Native Americans have some specific items that they made that were uh, beautifully adorned. This is a prisoner tie. And 
they made these specifically to be carried. Every warrior carried a prisoner tie with them so that if the circumstances availed, they would have the means to take a captive and bring them back to their people. And this is uh, another, uh, what we call sometimes a prisoner collar. And it's very interesting that the prisoner collar is very reminiscent if you were to look at a tump line, which they would, a burden strap that they would pack their materials in. It's, this is like a miniature tump line. Except uh, instead of the middle part being like 24 to 28 inches long, it's only like 11 to 12 inches long because that section was to go around the neck and it's only basically a ceremonial show that would be put on the uh, prisoner or captive when they came back were brought back to the village so here you have artwork items I mean we call them artwork today but you have items that were specifically made to have specific meaning and had a specific use so it's part of their culture and for those of you that can't kind of get an idea, well, here's how it works. Uh, this is from a scrimshawed powder horn. And this is one that is currently on display down at Fort Pitt. Uh, I believe the powder horn display is still up. You have to ask Mike about it er uh, later on. And he could probably give you more information on the provenance on the horn itself. But this is a... This is, shows you a warrior uh, bringing back his captive. And you'll notice, and I know it's probably real hard to see, but she is wearing a prisoner collar. It's a ceremonial purpose. Where are her hands? They're freeing out. Okay? So many times what happens when somebody gets taken captive Yes, there were horror stories. We know that in today's modern world, people love to, to send all these little horror stories. It wasn't always complete horror. It was rough, and we'll talk about that in a second. But, uh, you know, the idea is you're just going to have to go with the flow, and you'll be okay. And that's the case here. So why do we need, have a need as a culture, the Native Americans, for taking captives? Well, I'll get the first one out of the way. And by the way, we're going to talk about retribution shortly. I'm not going to get it. That's a whole other topic. Uh, I'm not going to talk about torture practices and so forth because that was part of uh, Eastern Woodland culture as well. I'm only going to talk about the semi-happier place where uh, the captives are being taken. Um, a big part of it was replacing lost family members. Replacing a lost family member that was killed recently in battle, or um, there have been accounts where uh, a child dies. And the husband, and I'll, I'll read an uh, excerpt from, for you in a little while, <clears throat> where the husband comes back and brings his wife a new daughter. So it's, and it's, I think for most people, that's kind of a concept of pretty out there. Um, the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois people, were boosting their population numbers. They were all about the population numbers and keeping and maintaining a large uh, group. And the best way to do that is to adopt captives into your culture. And then they were also used to increase labor force. So now we'll talk about the capture. And I threw these two pictures. These are the ones from Fort Pitt. Uh, two dioramas they did. And obviously you have the one gal on the left who her settlement was attacked. And uh, it's Massey uh, Harrison, I believe is the last name. And she tried to evade the best she could with her child. Uh, it didn't work out so well for her. And she ended up being taken captive. It's very difficult if you consider yourself on the frontier and 
you get attacked, maybe your cabin, uh, your farm, your settlement, a lot of confusion going on. And some of these individuals, unfortunately, saw their family members, or most of their family, if not all of it, killed before their eyes. And then they had that dread that I'm going to be taken captive and what am I, what's going to happen to me? There was a lot of, a lot of unknown. And that kind of adds to why they tried to document and publish as many of these captive stories as possible because it goes back to that intelligence, that military intelligence. Now, it wasn't so much militarily used, but it was used by the public to get across. This is, this is what could happen. If you go out on the frontier and you try to make it on your own, this is what you may face. It's a reality. This is happening. <clears throat> so um, you get captured. The prisoner tie, which is more of a, or less an intricately, uh, it's, a, it's a twine process. And sometimes they, when they weave that, they finger weave that, it turns out round. But sometimes they use an intricate, and for those of you who are hand weavers, uh, more of a box braid. And I have several uh, gentlemen who have actually held uh, original prisoner ties uh, from this continent and the ones that were sent over to Europe. There's another piece of information that's very interesting. So not only are we sending detailed uh, intelligence back to Europe, we're also categorizing and cataloging artifacts and sending it over for people to inspect and look at. So now we have this huge amount of artifacts that we can access in Europe that are almost like the day that they were sent because they were just kept as a, as a record. Uh, so when they look at the prisoner ties, you know, you get tied and you have this, what I call the journey after the capture. Uh, this is Griffin's, uh, the capture of Mary Jemison. And this is just a small, snippet of his entire painting and in the background you see the cabin and there's smoke and flames and so one of the major hardships of being a captive was being taken back to whichever village or uh, camp or gathering the natives were going to take you and sometimes that didn't go so well uh, there are accounts of children crying, and if they could not be uh, quieted or were causing too much trouble, uh, they may be killed and left to lay along the trail. And it is very unfortunate. But if you were successful in making the journey back, your ordeal was not quite finished. Uh, here is a Lee Teeter uh, painting, and uh, Lee is a another, I don't want to say obscure artist, uh, but he's kind of made himself obscure because he doesn't do much limited edition art. Um, Lee was at the beginning, even before Griffin, uh, trying to portray colonial frontier life and some western life as well. But I thought this was a very unique picture. Because uh, imagine a baby that is saved. And this will come back when, it, when we get towards the end. So this child really has no cognitive awareness of what's happened. And in a very short time, that child, that baby infant is not going to have any understanding of the world except for being native. So you have to take that into account uh, as we move forward here. Now earlier I had mentioned uh, taking captives as part of a culture. Well, it's also a ritual. Uh, I showed you a part of an original powder horn with a drawing engraving on it of a captive being taken. This is actually a drawing that was sent back to uh, the French commanders 
by some subordinates to kind of give them the best picture of what happened when captives were taken into a village. And you can imagine yourself a French missionary and you have this whole theology and idea that you are going to try and pass along to the natives. You have directives from your higher ups and all of a sudden you have this happen and you're in the uh, village and a big ruckus commotion starts to gather up and people start to gather and they start uh, war hooping <clears throat> and in comes this procession very ceremoniously <clears throat> and there's several things to take from this drawing the gentleman in the front has the scalp pole carrying the scalps that were taken on whatever uh, military action uh, they were on. The middle gentleman is the captive. The gentleman at the end is the captor. Obviously he's got the lead ends of the prisoner collar. And I hope you can see the object in the gentleman, the captive's hand. Because it wasn't just, oh, we captured some prisoners, let's take them over to our stockade or our little jail. Again, there's a whole ceremony and there's a whole <clears throat> series of steps that take place when you bring a native in. Sometimes the, na the captives were ritually painted. Uh, the one common denominator, obviously, is the prisoner tie and the prisoner collar. And the object in the gentleman's hand is a shishikwe, is a rattle. And what they would do is, as they would come into the village, um, the captive would have to have a ceremonial rhythm, and they would actually uh, be singing as they brought the captives in. So if you're a captive, you better figure out the rhythm real quick, or you might face some retribution from your captors until you do get the right rhythm down. And um, it's much similar to a stomp dance. And in Native American culture, a stomp dance is a mimic repeat style of music where the leader will most often have a rattle and the reader, or the leader will set the beat and will do a uh, series of uh, songs and will give lines for the people that are following the stomp dance to repeat. And the same thing happens here uh, in this ritual of bringing the captives in. Now, does anybody have an idea? When you think of Native American captives, what is one thing that's been pretty much put into all of our heads through media, movies, teaching? What, what, what was one thing that captives most certainly were thought to have to face when they got to an Indian village. Gauntlet. Gauntlet. No ringers from the crowd, please. And I know this is kind of dark. I don't know how well it came across. Um, this is a contemporary artist from Kentucky by the name of Steve White. And again, I apologize for using contemporary paintings, or you're going to see some really neat sketches from uh, some novels and books uh, from the 1800s. We don't really have a clear picture of what some of these things look like unless we find it in some of those reports, like some of the things I've showed you earlier. Um, the gauntlet was that feared idea that you were going to have to face multiple groups of your captors and it's kind of interesting the whole concept of the gauntlet is not new it's not um, a peculiar singularity of eastern woodland indians 
The gauntlet is a concept which is very interesting that has been used on all continents and all parts through history. Roman soldiers used to use this concept all the time. Um, it's kind of interesting. You have these different cultural groups, but they all seem to come up with the same theme. And they have not been introduced to each other yet. So it's not like we could learn it from Romans, and Romans can learn it from the Native Americans. So that's kind of an interesting, intriguing thought to stick in your head. So basically, the gauntlet <clears throat> was, for lack of better terminology, was a way to test the captives for strength and integrity. But I hate to say this, it was also used for an amusement. And in some cases, depending on the emotional situation, you're looking at a fact that they could have just lost part, a whole part of their tribe uh, in, in a battle that happened not too long ago. This is how they're, it's kind of like getting their anger out in some respects. But it, it was on many different levels, the purpose. And I'll show you a couple of pictures here. And this is, these are from some 1800s books uh, trying to depict what happens. <clears throat> Anybody have any idea of some famous individuals that had to run the gauntlet with Eastern Woodland Indians? Yeah. Smith. Hmm? Smith. Smith, yeah. Smith is famous, but in most worlds, not so famous. Not If you say James Smith, people are like, uh. Follow the, follow the river. Those two women. Yep. And that, she brings up a good point where I was going next. It wasn't just the men that ran the gauntlet. The only individuals, from what I can tell, that did not run the gauntlet were like children and toddlers. So if you're like in your teens, you're kind of like an adult, and you had to run that. If you're a woman, you had to run that. Men, definitely. Now, here's the interesting part. Again, depending on the emotional air, but also depending on who was going to run the gauntlet, it would be on how hard it was on you. Obviously, men got a little harder than the women or the younger people. And again, they're testing you. They're, they're testing to see if you're worthy for life beyond the gauntlet. And let me uh, grab a couple of a couple of little readings here for you. Now, you, at the end, you can come up and take a look at these. Uh, a friend of ours in West Virginia. Uh, an avid researcher, Alan Spencer, he took meticulous time and he's like, you know, we all spend time and we drag all these books when we go different places and it's really hard to, you're trying to find that one quote to share with somebody. So what he took it upon himself is he wrote a book and his book is actually a compilation of different quotes and he organized them based on topic material. So these are my cheater sheets to read to you some ex excerpts from journals. But uh, they're called They Gave the Scalpaloo, and he's got four volumes right now. Um, we're trying to get him to come up next year to speak with us. Okay. It says, much has been said on the subject of preliminary cruelties inflicted on prisoners when they enter an Indian village with the conquering warriors. It was certain that it was treatment is very severe when a particular revenge is to be exercised. So that's why I said it's that, that emotional air. I can say with truth that in many instances it is rather a scene of amusement than punishment. Much depends on the courage and presence of mind of the prisoner. On entering the village, 
he is shown a painted post at a distance from 20 to 40 yards and told to run to it and catch hold of it as quickly as he can. On each side of him stand men, women, and children with axes, sticks, and other offensive weapons ready to strike him as he runs. In the same manner is done in the European armies when soldiers, as is called, run the gauntlet. If he should be so unlucky as to fall in the way, he will probably be immediately dispatched by the same person, longing to avenge the death of some relation or friend slain in battle. But the moment he reaches the goal, he is safe and protected from further insult until his fate is determined. If a prisoner in such a situation shows a determined courage and when bid to run for the painted post starts at once with all his might and exerts all his strength and agility until he reaches it, he will most commonly escape without harm and sometimes without any injury. Whatever, and on reaching the desired point, he will have the satisfaction to hear his courage and bravery applauded. But woe to the coward who hesitates and shows any symptoms of fear. He is treated without much mercy and is happy at last if he escapes with his life. And, this is, and that was from the History, Manners, and Customs of the Indian Nations who once inhabited Pennsylvania and neighboring states by John Heckwilder. Heckwilder was a missionary who spent um, time in documenting the different aspects of native life and culture. Imagine their arrival, the whole village, or rather the whole country, going to meet them at 500 paces from the village and to welcome them, but in a strange way. Everyone is armed with a club, another with a handful of thorns, another with a knife, and a firebrand. They form in lines on both sides and mercilessly strike the prisoners until they have reached the platform prepared for the exhibition of their cruelty. And that was an excerpt from the Jesuit relations. In speaking of the Indian places of refuge for the unfortunate, I observed that if a captive taken by the reputed power of the beloved things of the ark should be able to make his escape into one of these towns or even into the winter house, he is delivered from the fiery torture otherwise inevitable. So that basically means that if he was able to get through uh, the gauntlet, they would survive. So that's the, the next phase. Now, after that was a determination of what to do with the person. Uh, obviously, if you didn't show bravery and honor and spirit, you may, if you were lucky, be put into a slave labor aspect. If not, you may be killed in retribution for a slain uh, native. But if you were so lucky to be taken in as a family member, you got the next phase. Next phase is very interesting. Next phase is, was a ritual washing. So if you were lucky and you were going to be adopted into a native family, what they would do to you is they would prepare you. Uh, James Smith, uh, we talked a little bit about him yesterday. <clears throat> he was uh, captured and taken, and he survived up to this point. And he had a chief that was going to take him in, and they were going to give him a family. So after he did all this, he survived the gauntlet, they made sure he was, uh, his wounds were taken care of, and he was sitting in his uh, little lodge, and a gentleman came in, and Smith wrote an excellent account, and if you get a chance to get a hold of his uh, journal, it's very worth reading. But he talks about the gentleman plucking the hairs from his head a couple at a time. And it got to the point where it was getting difficult because the hairs were slippery. So the gentleman had a little uh, shell with some fire ash in it. And he would continually dip his fingers in the fire ash and use it to pull away 
all the hair except for the back of his scalp lock, which was a customary uh, hair style for Native American woodland Indians. And after they plucked him, James Smith goes on to say, they gave me this beautiful collar of wampum around my neck and placed silver armbands on my arms. So now imagine yourself in this situation. You've just survived taking a beating, and now they're being nice. Then you get your hair plucked out. Then they pull you out of the lodge and hand you over to three young ladies. And the three young ladies take him down to the river, and he was afraid for his life because he's like, this is it. They've all dressed me up. They've trussed me up. And now I'm, 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 I'm a goner. I mean, and he'll, he says this in his journal. <clears throat> and they try to tell him to go under the water. And he does not understand what is taking place. Well, what is taking place is they're going to wash him. They're going to ritually wash him. And when, they, when he finally figures out that they aren't going to drown him, because that's what he was fearing, that they were going to drown him in the river, he went along with the flow. And this is a depiction um, from the 1800s, an artist's conception of what that might look like. And you can see the large collar. You can see the, the armbands and the three maidens that are going to ritualistic wash him. And he said, it felt like they were taking my skin off. But the idea was they were washing away his previous culture so that when he came out, he was born a new native. And, you know, when we think about, again, uh, Tim Tadish had a very strong point yesterday about we look at the 18th century world, we can't use a modern mindset so when we think about how prisoners are taken today and how they're treated and so forth, you can't transfer that back into the 18th century. It just doesn't work. <clears throat> but this was a meaningful thing. This was, this was just as important as a, uh, a Sunday uh, go-to-church ritual. And afterwards, he was given the finest clothes and dressed and told that they were going to have a feast that night in his honor, at which the chief spared no expense in gathering a multitude of uh, dishes and different animals to cook for this feast, especially to welcome his new son into the family. Uh, Mary Jemison, as I s said earlier, is another... Uh, interesting story about being captive uh, this is a, a book's perspective and you can see Mary Jemison is a smaller girl didn't have to go through as harsh as an ordeal as James Smith and here they are dressing up in a finery for her feast and then if you want to know what today's uh, best how do we want to say best look sketch of that scene, and this is one of Griffin's prints that he did uh, based on Mary Jemison's story as she's being prepared for the feast. And notice the, the reason I put this on here is because notice the attention. Every captive that was adopted in constantly says they treated us as if we were their own. And the interesting one is Daniel Boone. I mean, Daniel Boone's not going to lie, right? Why would Daniel Boone lie? Davy Crockett would lie, yes. Daniel Boone, no. Um, Daniel Boone said they were like his own sisters. And there's, uh, in one of uh, the books on Daniel Boone's life, it talks about later in life after Daniel passes, one of his uh, granddaughters runs into one of his adopted sister's granddaughters and they talk about and they communicate and they said how much they loved Daniel Boone uh, 
and and love them as as one of their own. <clears throat> and this picture uh, was taken. The picture for the models was taken at Ganondagan site up in uh, or, um, Irving, New York. No, not Irving. Um, Victor, New York. I'm sorry, near Rochester. Uh, they have an actual recreated 40 foot longhouse, and it is. The next best thing to experiencing what it was like, um, it's very interesting. And if you haven't been there, that's one of the to go to places. So this all being said, in 18th century society in Native America, you have your tribe, and your tribe has now been augmented with captives. So let's go back to the little baby that was being taken home by the warrior, what happens to that child? That child grows up as a native. Completely, 100%. Doesn't know anything else. So we have the confusion brought on by the French and Indian War. It didn't go so well, especially for some, depending on what, again, perspective you're coming from. Uh, the Haudenosaunee people are, are doing all right for themselves because they're sided with the victor. Uh, all the other people in the Ohio Valley sided with the French, not doing so well for themselves. So Pontiac decides we need to do something or else our culture itself is going to be completely obliterated. Pontiac saw the writing on the wall. And he tried, it was probably a, uh, a little too late type syndrome where he, to get the message across and get the m power and force that he needed to, it didn't work out so good. So Pontiac's rebellion ended up in a treaty guaranteeing natives in 63 that they were still going to have rights. They were not going to be assimilated and made to uh, be European. So they thought that was okay. There was one piece of the puzzle that left, um, I don't know if it left a bad taste in Bouquet's mouth, but Bouquet had some unfinished business. Because he's like, this is great. We're all going to be in this same treaty now. And everybody has the same understanding. We're going to try and live peaceably. But you have natural born European citizens in your tribes. We want them back. So in 1766, we have the Muskegon Treaty, and Bouquet basically tells the people, the natives, we're going to be fine with what we said in 63, but we need to make it better. So you need to give back the captives. So they had a huge council. This is a Benjamin West uh, painting, and this is the beginning part of the Treaty of Muskegon. Now, and if I kind of skip around, try to bear with me a little bit, give you a little side note here. Anytime a council or treaty took place, it was not, uh, oh, we're done in a couple hours or done in a day. Many times it carried on for days. Because uh, Native Americans, everything had a purpose, everything had a meaning. I think uh, if anything in today's life we could learn from that is that everything you do had a meaning to them. In today's world, it's just kind of like, eh, you know, we're just going to go down here, going to sign some papers, eh. No, everything had ceremony, everything had purpose, everything was given the meaning that they felt it should. So... Negotiations were not taken in very lightly, carried on for days. So they basically come up with an agreement that they're going to hand back to captives. So this is uh, from the documentation. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's Benjamin West's best do at giving back to captives. Think about that child who grew up with the language of whatever Native American tribe you lived with and, and the customs and everything else, maybe that child was a year, 
didn't really have a cognitive realization, now that child is five or six, you are going to tear that child away from his mother and father and take him over here. So kind of, I mean, think about that. But conversely, think about the fact that that's what happened in the first place to get the child into the Native American tribe. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a vicious time period. Uh, <clears throat> and it's uh, trouble for the natives because they're trying to keep and maintain their culture. And yet things are being stripped away from them. And if you can't see that one, I, I put two slides up here because I had two different sources of the same picture to kind of get an idea. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to see, but you see the child does not want to go back. So let's give you uh, some picture references. We did this anniversary of the Treaty of Muskegon several years ago at Bushy Run. Um, and here is from based on the documentation. So here is uh, a member who was adopted in, does not want to go back, and what do you notice? So here is a captive that was taken when they were young. They've assimilated into native culture, so they came in on a prisoner tie, and now because they don't want to go back, they're being taken back out of the tribe on a prisoner tie. Kind of an ironic uh, act as they tear the families apart. This one's always, this next one's always an interesting one. The redhead in the middle is my daughter. So it did not go well because some of them were so ingrained and were happy with their native families, believe it or not. Life was not all that bad. In some respects, some of these people that were taken native captives reported that, hey, life's not as bad as you guys are trying to tell everybody it is. And in fact, there were some captives that left captivity, came back to a city, had somebody transcribe their story, and then went back. They wanted people to know that, hey, this is just like all of us. It's a, it's, it needs to be respected. It needs to be honored. It may not have happened in a uh, nice way, but we're not being ill-treated, and life is not that bad. And then there were some uh, captives that, I, I like this picture a lot. <clears throat> this is a uh, father and his adopted son, uh, older, but some of the captives understood what was happening and promised their adoptive parents that they would always honor and remember them until they could meet them again and basically will go peaceably and will not cause problems. And that was the hard part with this whole treaty is getting back uh, the captives without problems taking place because the natives, they were kind of in a precarious position. Uh, they had to make it go as smoothly as possible. And then I, I threw this, this is, this is kind of a cool, this is a, um, I found this, this is off of a uh, dime novel from the 1800s about the life and times of Colonel Daniel Boone. <clears throat> but it's kind of, Interesting because what does it show? It shows the ritualistic painting of Daniel Boone as he's being in, uh, being adopted by Blackfish. Blackfish was a very predominant chief of the Shawnee Nation, and Boone played it off pretty good. Boone did the deal. He survived the rituals. They took him into the family. They loved him. They thought he was great. He thought that he loved his adopted sisters if they were his own blood. There's constantly little anecdotes where one of the things that the native family remembered about Boone was that he always made sure that his two adopted younger sisters were always protected and that he always brought them little gifts all the time. So if life's bad, you're not going to do those kinds of things. But Boone played the game, and then he waited until he 
uh, had the opportunity to escape eventually. And, and it was hard for him because he was faced with facing some of these people that were calling them their own uh, later on on the settlement raids in Kentucky. Uh, our idea of Eastern Woodland life and captives is uh, kind of marred. I don't know if marred is the right word, but popularized maybe in pop culture. Uh, here's a 1950s book called The Captive Women. Uh, so these concepts were used and <clears throat> our good old friend Walt and Fess, Walt Disney and Fess Parker, um, and in retrospect, this is probably one of the best pieces done on this topic. And you're going to say, boy, you, you, the heat's really gotten cooked your brain. If you don't remember seeing this piece or have never seen this piece, my suggestion to you is you find it and you watch it. You're not watching it for historical authenticity in settings and costumes and stuff like that. Watch it for the story, especially thinking about the things we talked about. Because it is probably one of the best stories. In fact, we use this um, as a middle school read. Because it's a, it's a novel that was um, made into a movie. <clears throat> and the whole idea is this young lad was taken very early on. All he knows is Delaware culture. He's the son of a chief. And because the chief knows the importance of this treaty, he has to give up his only son. Because the, the uh, young boy was a replacement for a son that was lost. And now we're going to kind of tie some of all these things together. The only beef I have with the whole movie is the mohawk hairdo. Okay, it's not exactly, it would have been much better if they would have done a traditional scalp lock. But, if you think about what we talked about, let's gain some perspective now. So even though it's not historically correct, okay, but you think about it, here he comes, does he look like the rest of the uh, colonial people? No. He is, and I know that might be a little dark for you, but here is a scene where they're trying to welcome him back. His real parents have... Now, here's the thing. Remember what we talked about, the captives. You, get, you, you go through all the trials and tribulations. You get welcomed in. You get new clothes and everything else. Well, here we go. He's brought back into uh, the colonial society. Parents give him a whole brand new set of clothes. We are going to have a big feast and party in your honor. We're so happy to have you back. We love you so much. And he still has those remnants of native culture as a reminder in, in basically his hairstyle. Uh, and does not understand the culture. And this is a very interesting scene uh, where they do the ring in the cake thing. And the whole idea behind the little scene was the ring and the cake. And if you get the ring, you're supposed to give it to your favorite gal. Well, what they told him is Johnny gets the ring and the cake. And they tell him, he's like, what do I do with this? Because he has no idea of that custom. And they say, oh, well, you give it to the person you admire. Well, he walks over and he gives it to Fess Parker. Because he admired Fess Parker for taking him under his wing on the way back from the Bouquet uh, Muskegon Treaty. And because he tried to end his life and everything else in the story. And, and, and the Fess Parker's character kind of takes him under his wing and tries to bring him back along into that. Uh, so think about how confused would you be when you came back. So it's, it's a difficult situation. And then the other key pivotal thing in this movie was we talked about some of these characters in the round table yesterday was the Paxton boys. These were the good old boys that were kind of stepping out of the bounds in the name of saving everybody from the tyranny of these bloodthirsty natives because they were kind of bored and they liked the action from the previous engagements and when there's you know no war idle idle men make too much trouble so uh, 
here is uh, Johnny coming back and having to deal with not only his family, but the storyline puts him right in amongst the, the political air of the Paxton boys. So again, if you get a chance, well worth the watch. Well worth the watch. And then, of course, you might recognize this scene. Uh, one of our other pop culture uh, ideas and beliefs as we see the uh, captives of Native Americans is Last of the Mohicans. And while that was a that was kind of a wild story that Fenimore Cooper did trying to weave all kinds of aspects of colonial frontier life and Native Americans all together with some of those captive themes put into it. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you a couple things real quick, and then I'll open it up for uh, questions. Okay. And this one is actually from... Um, James Smith's uh, account of his captivity. And it says, When I was thus seated, the Indians came in and dressed and painted in the grandest manner. As they came in, they took their seats, and for a considerable time, there was a profound silence. Everyone was smoking, but not a word was spoken among them. At length, one of the chiefs made a speech which was delivered to my by an interpreter and was a uh, followeth. My son, you are now flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone. By the ceremony which was performed this day, every drop of white blood was washed out of your veins. You are taken into the Conowango Nation and initiated into a warlike tribe. You are adopted into a great family and now received with great seriousness and solemnness in the room and place of a great man. After what was passed this day, you are now one of us by an old strong law and custom. My son, you have now nothing to fear. We are now under the same obligations to love, support, and defend you that we are to defend one another, therefore you are to consider yourself as one of our people. At this time, I did not believe the speech, I did not believe this fine speech, especially that of the white blood being washed out of me. But since that time, I have found that there was much sincerity in said speech, for from that day, I never knew them to make any distraction, distinction excuse me, between me and themselves in any respect whatever until I left them. If they had plenty of clothing, I had plenty. If we were scarce, we all shared one fate. After the ceremony was over, I was introduced to my new kin and told that I was to attend a feast that evening, which I did. And as the custom was, they gave me also a bowl and wooden spoon which I carried with me to this place where there was a number of large kettles full of boiled venison, green corn. Everyone advanced with his bowl and spoon and his share given him. After this, one of the chiefs made a short speech and then we began to eat. So again, that's kind of, that's a really good uh, sum up of the James Smith uh, narrative. And there's always lots of uh, welcomes into the tribe in most of the accounts. Here's a different account. It says, when they at length arrive at the residence of the conqueror, many of the prisoners are received into the families to supply the places of the slain or relations lately deceased and are immediately considered as members of the nation. Without this custom, many Indian tribes would have been exterminated long ago. So remember what I said earlier about reasons for taking captives was to increase and bolster your population numbers. Now, with that said, there's an interesting twist. 
you are bolstering your population numbers, you are continuing your culture, but then in today's era and world of importance of bloodline, what does that do to a bloodline? So that makes an interesting quandary in today's world that our modern native counterparts are dealing with at this point. Uh, but their true characteristic suffers visible change by the naturalization of foreigners. The new inhabitant meets with the best treatment, his wounds are dressed, and he's well clothed. The best food in the house is given him, and all the family is engaged in comforting and encourage him. Female prisoners are generally given to men and well treated. Boys and girls are either received into families as servants or sold to the Europeans, which also did occur. If prisoners thus admitted into families behave well, they have everything they want, nor are they put to much labor, which in general is little regarded by an Indian. But if they run away and are taken, their lives are in danger. Even the nation to whom the runaways belong will not always receive them, but treat them as ungrateful beings. They therefore turn out vagrants and infest the woods. Indian names are given to European prisoners upon the reception into Indian families to perpetuate the memory of the most beloved among the slain deceased. Many of them find the manner of living among the Indians so well suited to their inclinations that upon exchange of prisoners being made, they refuse to return to their own country. But should the pardoned stranger lose the goodwill of the widow of the deceased, she soon puts him to death that he may become servant to her first husband in the land of the spirits. <clears throat> so I'll kind of close out with that to kind of give you, again, just a brief introductory and perspective into this. It's, it's really very fascinating, but huge topic of captivity among Eastern Woodland Indians in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, the practice of taking captives did not stop with the Muskegon Treaty. It continued on um, and took place well past the turn of the century. Um, I think you find some differences in Western cultures of the way they treat their captives as opposed to what happens in Eastern cultures. Eastern cultures, again, I think tended to do a little more uh, bring into the family, make them welcome if they were worthy, if they were deemed worthy. Um, you can come up at the end here. I do have a uh, prisoner tie reproduction that you want to take a look at. Uh, you can take a look at Alan's books. And if you have not got this into your library, they are clearancing these puppies out at Fort Niagara in their bookstore. This is the memoirs of the late war in North America between France and England by Pouchot, who was stationed at Fort Niagara. And he has some incredibly detailed besides the stuff on the French Indian War, incredibly detailed section on uh, Eastern Woodland Natives and their life ways and their customs. So hopefully that was okay for a filler. I kind of had to put that together at the last minute. We're in the midst of uh, remodeling our office and I had some other books, but I could not. <laughs> Do you think I could find it when I wanted it? No. So hopefully I did, a well, did okay and uh, we'll give you a primer for when Beth returns with us next year uh, and gives her perspective from her family's uh, story of being taken captive. So thank you.